The development of this podcast was sponsored by Alexian Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. The viewpoints expressed are those of the person speaking and not of Alexian. Welcome to NMOSD Your Way Global, an educational podcast series for NMOSD patients worldwide. NMOSD stands for Neuromyelitis Optica Spectrum Disorder, a rare relapsing autoimmune disorder of the central nervous system which primarily affects the optic nerves and the spinal cord. Your podcast hosts Lelania Lloyd and Debbie Latik, who have both lived with NMOSD for over 10 years, will be bringing their respective Canadian and Australian perspectives to the table in order to help patients worldwide better understand NMOSD. Over the next 16 episodes, clinicians, researchers, and fellow patients will come together to have important conversations about how to live your best life within your diagnosis. They will be offering up encouragement and practical tips for overall health and well-being. In this episode, Lelania sits down with Kat Anderson, a partner and spiritual director at REACH Trauma Response Consulting. Kat helps us understand how honesty and connection can enhance our relationships, how we can build and strengthen our self-esteem as people living with chronic illness and disability, and reminds us of the importance of having compassion for ourselves. So, let's get started. So, welcome to the podcast, Kat. To begin with, I'm wondering if we can start with um, talking about what kind of an impact a diagnosis of a rare disease such as neuromyelitis optica can have on a relationship. Wow, that's a really big question. And I would like you to answer that and let me kind of bounce off of that for you. Sure. I think there's a lot of um, moving parts to that question. I think it impacts um, your finances. It's not inexpensive to be somebody with a rare disease and chronic illness. Um, it has an emotional impact, um, not just on the person who is diagnosed with the disease, but all the people around them that love that person. I think it can have an impact on intimacy. Um, you know, when you're not feeling well, you know, it, it, it makes it tough sometimes. It can impact your ability to plan your family because, you know, pregnancy and NMO can be a real challenge and it's not without, you know, its own set of complications. You know, there's just so many parts to it, but also just your relationship with the people in your life. Chronic illness and disability can cause, you know, a lot of impact with people having to step into a caregiver role sometimes when you're really not well, or if you have permanent disability. So it's a lot of pieces to it. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. And yes, receiving a diagnosis can be so disorienting. It can be disorienting in all of those ways that you have mentioned. And the biggest thing that we can do is to try to stay connected to what is true. What is true is so important. Receiving this kind of diagnosis can at first bring relief for some people because they've been like trying so hard to find out what's going on and been mm -hmm. shoveled around in the medical system until finally they receive this diagnosis and it can be so relieving. And yet now what do I do? And it leaves us feeling groundless when that comes. So finding something to do that can bring us back to this space where we can reconnect with what is true for us. Everything is changing. I agree. And I, I like that you're saying disorienting because I think that's a really good description. I've never thought of it that way, but I think that that's really an apt description of sort of where you feel like your whole world as you knew it is kind of torn out from underneath you and you have to kind of figure out the new normal. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the thing is that we are changing as we, as we are born and go through life, we are always changing. And this is the new journey. Mm -hmm. How do we change with that? How do we change with that? How do we let go of all of those preconceived ideas of how things should have gone. That's what makes us suffer so much. When we, yeah. when we 
hold that, but to open space around, oh, okay, new journey. This is my journey. And how do I live within that? That's the, really the big question. Mm -hmm. How do I stay connected and live? How do I live? This is a chapter. This is not the end of the book. Yeah. And I think that there's definitely a period of grieving within that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to be able to acknowledge that, acknowledge that and create a space where you can grieve that. So important. That's normal. We've mm -hmm. been shocked having a diagnosis like this. We've mm -hmm. been shocked. We've been shocked and we grieve our lost expectation of how life should be. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's okay sometimes to not be okay. Beautifully said. It is absolutely okay not to be okay. That's being, that's being true. That's being true to ourselves. That's acknowledging our emotions and our body when they're telling us, ouch, I'm hurting. This rocked me. And it's so important. That's part of staying connected to ourselves. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think sometimes people try and shove those feelings down. And, you know, the more you try and shove it down, the more it's going to jump up and bite you in the butt, I think, like, <laughs> you know, at some point, you have to deal with it, and you have to talk about it and kind of get it out into the open. I think you know, if you're shoving it down, it just will fester endlessly. Yep, absolutely. So one of the biggest things that we can do when that happens is we give ourselves time. We give ourselves time with kindness and compassion. We hold ourselves tenderly like we would a friend who has come to us and they are, they are sad and they're grieving and they're out of sorts because everything has changed for them. What would we do? Would we say, oh, you don't really feel like that. Smarten up. Come on now. Lock it up. The right side. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. We would hold them and we would say, oh my gosh, that's so hard. Well, the question is, do we do that to ourselves? Can we be that way with ourselves? For those who are not currently in a relationship, there can be a tendency to think that someone would never want to date or marry somebody with a chronic illness. And a lot of that stems from ableism, the idea that society has that being chronically ill or disabled makes us a burden and unworthy of love and acceptance. Can you talk a little bit about how living with this kind of stigma can affect our self-esteem? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to ask myself whether or not I believe that is true for myself. And if I don't, how am I living in relationship to myself so that I can show that I believe differently to others? The most important thing in relationships is starting at the foundation of all relationships, and that is how we are related to ourselves. How we see ourselves is how we show up in any situation or relationship with another person. If we are feeling unworthy, devalued, less than the other, they will pick that up. So we, we are invited with this diagnosis to look at ourselves in a very inner way, to clearly see that we are not NMO. We are ourselves. We are ourselves, the truth of ourselves. An animal can initially become the biggest voice in the room, but when we, like we just talked about, open space, acknowledge, allow, grieve that loss of hope or expectation of life, and allow ourselves to come to a place where we realize that we are not an NMO. We are ourselves. And to live from that place, to do everything we can to nurture ourselves is what brings light and life into all of relationships. Mm -hmm. How does that sound? 
You know, I, as you're saying that, I was thinking back to when I was first diagnosed and, you know, for the first year, I didn't tell anybody because I just needed time to kind of, you know, figure out where I was emotionally with what, what I had been told and, and the diagnosis I'd been given. And, you know, when I'm talking to people who are newly diagnosed, because people reach out to me periodically and I say to them, you know, like that first year, you're going through a really heavy grieving process and a, and a period of adjustment. And, you know, after that first year, you kind of figure out how much room you're going to allow NMO to take up in your life. Mm -hmm. But it takes time. It takes at least a year to kind of get to that point where, you know, you're you're having treatments, you're maybe telling people in your lives, you may be making some adjustments if you're working. You know, it's all these things. And if you've had a really bad relapse that led to your diagnosis, maybe you're working on recovering from that. And that's a really intense period of time. But once that starts to let up a bit and, and you kind of fall into the rhythm of this is what my life is now and this is, you know, how it's going to be going forward, you can kind of be like, OK, well, I have to deal with it on these levels. I have to have medication. I have to, you know be careful of things that, that, you know, I'm struggling with and figure out how to do them and all of these things and, and navigate the relationships that might've changed, you know, because of the diagnosis. And then you figure out, okay, well, it's not as big as that voice in the room at the beginning, right? It, it becomes sort of background noise and sometimes you can tune it out and sometimes you can't. And, and I think it's really important for people to know that because, when you get that diagnosis, it feels like that's all there is. Oh, yeah. Do you know, I just love that. I love what you said. That just is so respectful to yourself. Like so respectful to give yourself that time and space to settle. That's, that's really beautiful and very healthy. So what can we do to counteract those negative messages that we might have internalized and build on our self-esteem? Yeah. Now, now that is a really great question because it involves two things. It involves skill and support. Mm -hmm. So having this, this place where we can be compassionate and kind hearted to ourselves is so important. And it's a skill that we develop, you know, having this this place of of negativity with ourself that comes into every relationship that we have so anything that we can do that will build our value and our worth which we have and you know so many people don't realize that whether they have animal or not you know and it's coming to this place where we realize the depth of our value and our worth. And, and when we start exploring that in ways that are particular to ourselves, some people love to bring mindful practices are so helpful. So meditation, poetry, anything that brings us connection where we realize how, how valuable we are and that we are part of this, this world, this environment. And building on, on our self-esteem, ourselves, ourselves actually allows so much space in the room, so much gentleness with the other when we come to, when we come into relationship and having acceptance of ourself means that sooner or later, we come around to a willingness to see how things really are and who we are. I think that um, negative messages begin in our own body with our own mind. And we decide what we're going to believe, what we're not. We decide how much we are part of this world and how much we decide to isolate. So recognizing that we have a voice at this human table is so important. And we have a lot to bring to other people. When you were saying that, it reminded me of um, a conversation that happened 
between Christopher and Dana Reeve, um, Superman, who was in that catastrophic horse riding accident that broke his neck and left him uh, quadriplegic. And he was in the hospital and, you know, he he woke up to like, you know, his whole world shattered, including his spinal cord. And his wife said to him, you're still you. Yeah. And I was like, you know, that that is so true. It doesn't matter what's happened to you. You're still yourself. Yeah. It's just that you have this one other piece of of information about yourself now that you're living with. And so, you know, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, you're say, for example, a wife, a mother, a friend, a daughter, a granddaughter, a, an aunt, um, a volunteer, an advocate, um, you know, all of these things, um, an artist, whatever it is in your life that that brings you joy and value in the way that you identify. And I think just remembering the fact that this changes a lot, but it also changes nothing at the same uh-huh. time, right? Yeah. Because it doesn't change the core of who you are. It's just one more piece of information, like your eyes are green or your hair is gray or whatever it is, right? It's yeah. one more fact about you. Absolutely. And it is not your identity because your identity is so much deeper than that. Just like it's not your identity that your eyes are green. So when you're entering into a new relationship, how do you decide when to disclose your diagnosis? Because I know a lot of people struggle with that Mm -hmm. and it's a big deal for people. Mm -hmm. Trust yourself. Trust yourself that you know. And when you are feeling comfortable so that that conversation becomes a comfortable conversation so that you are not coming to the conversation tentatively or defended, defensive. You are not defending why you have a right to be a friend or be in a, a, an intimate relationship. You don't have to do that. You are showing up in all truth. And when you feel comfortable, you will know. And depending on, as you, as you spend time with the person, you learn a little more about them, you actually may decide, well, you know, that's actually not really the person for me. And what would the pressure be like if you could be in a relationship with someone that didn't have some kind of prejudged outcome if you could just live in an honest truthful relationship with a person and love being with them in the moment and and if that is reciprocated wow that that is that is a deep that is a deep relationship already and just live into it and see where it goes but learn to trust trust yourself you have nothing to hide you have nothing to hide and those and and those who are are shocked and run away they are not the ones that we want to be in a relationship with anyway so thanks for letting me know yeah right (laughs) maybe that's just it if they're like that they're not your person for sure (laughs) so what are some of the positive things that we bring to our relationship because we've learned to navigate life with a rare disease so many things but I want to say the first one would be clear seeing you see life in a different way. You see life clearly. You see value and priority and what's important in life. All of a sudden, this can shake off everything that is false and bring us to this real ground of truth. And you offer that to others. Um, you, you, invite, you invite people to wake up to reality, to truth. You invite beauty. You invite vulnerability and wisdom, grace and patience and forgiveness. It's good to affirm those positives because so often, you know, we hear even from our doctors, this or that, or something else is wrong with you. Sometimes it's nice to be reminded all the things that are right with us. Yeah, absolutely. So how do we make space in our lives and relationships to just be a partner rather than a patient? Well, again, remembering that you are not an MO 
and remembering things like your longings, what you desire for and your interests, like connecting to all of those other pieces that are healthy and life-giving. Those are, those are things that we can offer and open space for. Very important. And being a caregiver for someone with NMO can be really challenging. How can caregivers look after their own health and well-being to avoid burnout? To be honest, be honest. This is a very intimate time of life. And to love deeply, to live time together, to be aware that there are no guarantees in life, to love yourself as a caregiver, to feel worthy, because lots of times caregivers don't, to speak openly and share kindly from the heart. Again, anything that opens connection, opens conversation, opens dialogue, that doesn't mean it's always going to be like wonderful or happy, but Mm -hmm. anything that opens dialogue and opens connection is opening relationship and it's deepening intimacy with the other. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to feel exhausted. It's okay to not know what to do. And to be able to say that, maybe that's the deepest intimate act that there is to be able to come together and say, I don't know what to do. Yeah. How beautiful is that? And just be there, just show up. Yeah, exactly. So Kat, um, I'm wondering what are the best resources that you'd recommend for those who might want to explore this topic further? Okay, so we talked about relationships today. So first is anything that is going to help us to have a deeper, truer relationship with ourself. Anything that's going to help us connect all of our body parts together, our mind, our heart, our body, our spirit, anything that's going to help connect that. That might be a mindfulness practice. Anything that's going to help us do deep inner work. Then another thing would be something that we could do with others. So that would be uh, finding a a support group, whether or not it's a local support group, or maybe it's a national one or an international one. Find others that you can share with that understand, but also that have ideas about how to live life within that, Not, not through NMO, but with NMO. Yeah, I think, you know, because of COVID and the times that we're living in, so much resources have moved online, which has made it infinitely accessible for people to get support and help. And I think those are some great suggestions. And and yeah, just having a mind, mindfulness practice, sometimes the simplest things have the biggest impact. Absolutely, because they're doable. Well, Kat, I really, really appreciate you taking this time with us. I think that you've definitely given our listeners something really important to think about, you know, how this disease affects the relationships and ways to, um, you know, stay healthy emotionally within that diagnosis when, when you're a caregiver, but also a patient. And I just really appreciate your time and energy in helping to care for our community. So thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. We hope you have enjoyed listening to this NMOSD Your Way Global Podcast. For more information about NMOSD and access to support and resources, please read the podcast description. What you have heard in this podcast may not be reflective of your own experience and does not replace the advice of a healthcare professional. If you have any concerns or specific questions about NMOSD, please speak to your physician.